Good evening, brothers and sisters, and uh, I'd like to welcome you into this nightly presentation. This is uh, number two in the series, The Three Angels' Messages, and uh, we are looking at uh, Revelation chapter 14. Uh, I pray that uh, this uh, series will be a blessing unto all of us. Yesterday, we were able to look at uh, number one in the series, why the three angels' messages. And uh, today, we are looking at, uh, at the topic, the everlasting gospel. And so before we enter into the session fully, I'd like us to pray and thank the Lord for everything. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, I say thank you once again for giving us uh, the energy, giving us the life, and giving us Jesus Christ as uh, our Redeemer. I pray that uh, as we look at these messages, that Father you will uh, do something special in our lives and even endure us with the Holy Spirit to continue in thy will. And so be with us and bless us at this moment. In Christ Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, we are given the messages of Revelation chapter 14 and we were able to look uh, at the introductory part, why the three angels' messages. And uh, for those who are not able to watch, you can go to my profile and uh, look at the presentation of yesterday. Uh, in summer, I can say that the reason why the three angels' messages are given is because darkness is all over the world and the Lord has to have a people who will shine forth and uh, uh, be the light of the world amidst the deceptions, amidst the darkness, amidst the sins that are happening in the world. And so this is the reason the Lord gives the everlasting gospel or the three angels' messages, which part of it is uh, the everlasting gospel. And uh, the Lord has ordained that uh, his church may show forth the manifold grace that Jesus Christ has endured unto it by dying at Calvary. And so I'd like to read something as begin that... Um, it is uh, in Acts of Apostles, page uh, 9, paragraph 1. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service, and its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. From the beginning, it has been God's plan that through his church shall be reflected the world, his fullness, and his sufficiency. The members of the church, those whom he has called out of darkness into his marvelous light, are to show forth his glory. The church is the repository of the riches of the grace of Christ and through the church will eventually be made manifest even to the principalities and powers in heaven places the final and full display of the love of God. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10. And Paul says that um, we are made spectacles to the angels and to the world in this uh preaching of the gospel which to others is foolishness uh to those who are being saved it's a savor of life unto life and so these messages we are told in uh, the book of matthew chapter 24 the gospel of this kingdom must go to the whole world and then the end shall come. Now, we understand that the gospel that has to go to the whole world and then the end will come is the same as the three angels' messages because the three angels' messages are the messages that really brings about the harvest, the ripening of the church and the separation of the tears from the uh, wheat. We find that um, the messengers, are, when, when you read Revelation chapter 14, 
we are told that I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. And so we want to look at uh, when we talk about angels flying in the midst of heaven, what are we talking about actually? These angels, who are they? In Revelation 14, 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And uh, when you look at Revelation chapter 1, verses 16, let us look at uh, Revelation chapter 1, verses 16, and see what does the Bible say the angel is. Because Revelation chapter uh, chapter 1, chapter 2, and uh, chapter 3, we are being introduced. In fact, chapter 2 and chapter 3, we are introduced to the, uh, the angels, to the seven churches. And uh, this is uh, uh, what uh, we read in uh, a, in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 16 and uh, verse 20. Who are these angels? This is what we read. That, uh, and he said in his right hand, and he, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And so uh, Jesus Christ is walking among us the candlesticks and uh, sending the messages to the seven stars or angels of the seven churches. And uh, uh, verses 20, this is what we find in verses 20 the mystery of the stars the mystery of the seven stars which thou sowest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sowest are the seven churches so the seven stars are, uh, are the angels of the seven churches and uh, uh, when uh, we talk about uh, these stars in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. In the book, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verses uh, 20, speaking about uh, these uh, stars and the angels. In the book, uh, Gospel Workers, page 13, paragraph, uh, paragraph 3, let us look at uh, gospel workers page 13 paragraph 3 and see what the prophet tells us are uh, these uh, stars and uh, the mystery of the stars and uh, these angels this is uh, what um, we read in uh, gospel workers Gospel Workers, page 13, paragraph 3. Uh, we are told God's ministers are symbolized by the seven stars, which he who is the first and the last has under his special care and protection. The sweet influences that are to be abandoned in the church are bound up with these ministers of God who are to represent the love of Christ. The stars of heaven are under God's control. He fills them with light. He guides and directs their movements. If he did not, they will become fallen stars. So with his ministers, they are but instrument in his hands and all the good they accomplish is done through his power and so we find that um, the angels the stars are uh, the messengers that uh, the lord is using uh, we find also in revelation chapter 12 verse 4 and 7 to 9 and job chapter 38 verse 7 that these are his ministers and uh, looking at galatians chapter 4 verses 14 Paul talking about 
who are the angels expounding more on these angels because we are talking about the everlasting gospel and we have been just told that uh, uh, in uh, Acts of Apostles that uh, the church is God's depository to uh, send forth the messages to the four corners of the world. Paul himself says this in Galatians chapter 4 verse 14, And my temptation which was in my flesh he despised not, not rejected, but received me, Paul, as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. So we find that Paul is saying that he also was received as an angel, as a messenger of the Lord. And so in Selected Messages, page 387, paragraph 1, the angels are represented as flying in the midst of heaven, proclaiming to the world a message of warning and having a direct bearing upon people living in the last day of this earth history. No one hears the voice of these angels, for they are a symbol to represent the people of God who are working in harmony with the universe of heaven. Men and women enlightened by the Spirit of God and sanctified through the truth proclaim the three, and three messages in their order. And uh, this is what we found out in the book of Malachi, uh, chapter 4, verses 5, that um, in the end time we shall have a people imbued by the spirit of Elijah. Let us look at uh, Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and verses 6. Behold, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Maybe we may ask ourselves, who are this, uh, who is this Elijah that the Bible is talking about? And uh, uh, we found that uh, yesterday, that uh, in the previous presentation, John came in the spirit of Eli Elijah. And in the end time, God will have a people imbued with the spirit of Elijah, with that courage, ready to carry the gospel, no matter what may happen to them. God will imbue his people with uh, the spirit of Elijah. Who are these Elijah people? 4 B.C page 1184, 4 BC, page 1184. We are talking about the everlasting gospel and looking at who are these angels, 4 BC, 1184. Paragraph, um, this is paragraph six. Let us start from paragraph six. In fact, we just go to paragraph eight. This is what the messenger of the Lord says. In this time of well-nigh universal apostasy, God calls upon his messengers to proclaim his law in the spirit and power of Elias. As John the Baptist, in preparing a people for Christ's first advent, called their attention to the Ten Commandments, so we are to give with no uncertain sound the message, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. With the earnestness that characterize Elijah the prophet and John the Baptist, we are to strive to prepare the way for Christ's second advent. Uh, this is 4 BC, uh, page uh, 1184, paragraph 8. And so this mess, these angels are messengers of God. They are ministers of the gospel. Now, this message that uh, was given to John, who are the people that are to proclaim these messages? Who are these ministers that are to proclaim uh, the message of the three angels? Uh, this we read in 4SP199, paragraph 2. 4SP, uh, the message that was given to John, who are the people to proclaim it. We read 
Jesus sends his people a message of warning to prepare them for his coming. To the prophet John was made known the closing work in the great plan of man's redemption. He beheld an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters, Revelation 14, uh, uh, Revelation 14, 6 and uh, 7. Now we continue reading that uh, uh, the angel, the angel represented in prophecy as delivered in this message symbolizes a class of faithful men, Elijah people, who obedient to the promptings of God's spirit and the teachings of his word, proclaim this warning to the inhabitants of the earth. This message was not to be committed to the religious leaders of the people. They had failed to preserve their connection with God and had refused the light from heaven. Therefore, they were not of the number described by the apostle Paul, but ye brethren are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. And so this message is not per se to the leaders. This message is for uh, a people who heeds the voice of God and in consecration, accepting the righteousness of Jesus Christ, they go forth preaching the gospel. And so in a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers, we are told. To, uh, to them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. This is what the Lord has called Adventists to be. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and the third angel's messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to observe their attention. And... Uh, just uh, drifting to uh, a little bit to uh, Christ Object Lesson, uh, page uh, 415. Christ Object Lesson, page 415, speaking about these messages. Paragraph 5. What is this everlasting gospel and the message that has to be preached to the whole world? Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, Behold your God, the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. The light of the Son of Righteousness is to shine forth in good works, in words of truth, and in deeds of holiness. This is the message that the Seventh-day Adventist has been given to give to the world, a message of the revelation of the character of love, the character of God. Uh, and we read in John chapter 3, verses 16. Reading in uh, John chapter 3, verses 16. The Bible tells us, this, this is what the Bible tells us. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have an everlasting life. God gave his son so that the gospel may be a savor of life unto life unto us. And uh, when we are talking about everlasting gospel, when the third angel's message is coming to an end when the third angel's message is coming to an end this is what we read revelation 14 verses 12 revelation uh, 14 verses 12 here is the patience of the saint here are they that keep the commandments of god 
and the faith of Jesus Christ. These are the people who have been separated from the world and they keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus Christ. Now somebody may ask, what is this faith of Jesus Christ? What is this faith of Jesus Christ? The prophet and the Lord bless this church with a prophet. Uh, manuscript releases uh, page uh, 193 paragraph 4 we find actually what is this uh, faith of Jesus Christ. What is this faith of Jesus Christ? The faith of Jesus it is talked of but not understood what constitutes the faith of Jesus that belongs to the third angel's message. Remember, we are talking about the everlasting gospel. Jesus becoming our sin bearer that he might become our sin pardoning savior. He was treated as we deserve to be treated. He came to our world and took our sins that we might take his righteousness. Faith in the ability of Christ to save us humbly and fully and entirely is the faith of Jesus. The only safety for the Israelite was blood upon the doorsteps. Post. God said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you in Exodus chapter 12, verse 13, when they were coming from Egypt. And so this is like, when we talk about the faith of Jesus Christ, it is being removed from the world and being taken in the land of Canaan. And only the thing which is clean, which has been cleansed by the blood, is what can stay in the land of Canaan. And so even as the blood on the doorsteps was able to help the angel pass over the Israelites, so the blood of Jesus Christ, when we appropriate it in our lives, is able to take us from the world and be able to save us humbly. We read, all other devices for safety will be without avail. Nothing but the blood of the doorsteps will be will bar the way that the angel of death should not enter. There is salvation for the sinner in the blood of Jesus Christ alone, which cleanses us from all sin. The man with a cultivated intellect may have a vast source of knowledge. He may engage in theological speculations. He may be great and honored of men and be considered the repository of knowledge. But unless he have a saving knowledge of Christ crucified for him and by his by faithless hold of the righteousness of Christ, he is lost. So it is only by the blood. Christ was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53 verse 5. Saved by the blood of Jesus Christ will be our only hope for time and song throughout eternity and so this everlasting gospel has to introduce uh, the people to the righteousness of jesus christ this everlasting gospel has to introduce people to the righteousness of jesus christ the blood of jesus christ which saves unto the uttermost it is only his righteousness that um, uh, can be accepted before uh, the Father who art in heaven. Our work is to benefit our fellow men. We are not to travel over the track of opponents to the truth, but to sound the message of the third angel who is flying the midst of heaven, proclaiming the note of warning, the commandments of God, and the testimony of Jesus Christ. But uh, it is not just sermonizing. It is revealing the life of Jesus Christ in our life, what he has done. And uh, we, are, we, we are told, we are admonished that uh, 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 we must be perfect even as our Father is perfect. And so this gospel, the everlasting gospel, is flying in the midst of heaven. It is something that is being seen by everyone. Reading in uh, the book of Hebrews, let us just go to the book of Hebrews and uh, see what uh, the Lord tells us. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10 about this everlasting uh, uh, covenant. We are told that uh, uh, 
for this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord, I'll put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I'll be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. And uh, going down some few verses, the book of uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verses uh, uh, 14. The book of uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. This is what we read. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And so the work of the gospel is, uh, as we are told in Romans, is to... Uh, is a power of God and salvation. And Paul says that he's not ashamed of uh, uh, of this gospel. And so let us try to go more uh, uh, another step uh, further in looking into this gospel. What is the everlasting gospel per se? Uh, the gospel is called victor over sin that is a christian we can live a sinless and a perfect life by the indwelling power of christ and we we find in romans chapter one and we shall be looking at that that the gospel is the power of god and salvation what power uh in john chapter one verse 12 we are told that for those who accepted him he gave them the power to become sons of god and we know that uh, the son of god uh, uh was jesus christ and in Jesus Christ was no sin. And so if we are to be called the sons of God, then there have to be no sin in our life. So, but the plan of redemption had yet a broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this Christ alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe so the whole issue of the gospel let us go to the book of romans chapter one uh, and just look at it when talking about uh, uh the gospel and the life of jesus christ the book of um, uh romans chapter one verse one going to verse uh 16 and 17. we read paul a servant of jesus christ called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God. And so Paul is separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised her for by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And what is this gospel concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the Dead. So the gospel of God is about the life of Jesus Christ, which is holiness. And this made him resurrect from the dead. Without having this power of holiness, without having the spirit of holiness, we cannot be resurrected from the dead. And so uh, Christ coming to die on this earth was not just for the mere uh, men but for the vindicating the character of god in the whole universe because satan had put a dent in the character of god by saying that he created a universe that he could not control and he gave commandments that could not be uh, uh, uh could not be uh kept by human beings and so the savior came to glorify the father by the demonstration of his love so the spirit was to glorify Christ by revealing his grace to the world. The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of character of his people. Desire of Ages, page 671. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, we read, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
in Romans chapter 16, verse 25, we read, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandments of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Now, talking about um, this mystery, we read in Revelation chapter 10, verse 7, but in the days of the voice of the seven angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. What is this mystery? Colossians 1, 26, 27, and 28. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generation, but now is made manifest to the saints, to whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we present everyone in Christ Jesus, that we may be able to present uh, every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So the whole issue of the gospel is prevent to, to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. John chapter 17, it is uh, uh, good to look at these verses and see what actually they mean unto us, the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the knowledge of God. In, uh, in the book of John chapter 17, in the book of John chapter 17, let us look at it, brothers and sisters. John chapter 17, verses 1, to 3, and uh, uh, we hear what the Lord is speaking to us about this gospel and the knowledge of God and His Son and what it produces in our lives. This is uh, what we read here. Uh, this word spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. And thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And so the knowledge of the father and the son in the theme of the everlasting gospel is to give us eternal life. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Now, speaking about this knowledge in the everlasting gospel, because uh, the gospel is the knowledge about Jesus Christ, his life, and his resurrection, and the spirit of holiness. A knowledge of Christ is a knowledge of God who gave him. And this knowledge and this acceptance of this life gives us eternal life and it increases something look at uh, second peter second peter this knowledge uh second peter chapter one verses one and two simon peter servant and an apostle of jesus christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And so the knowledge of uh, uh, God, what it produces in our life, it gives grace. And grace is this power. We are told that you are saved by grace not by thy own works that anyone should boast. So the grace is the power of God unto our life. This is the mystery that is to be revealed to the Gentiles, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory. This is the whole theme of the three angels' messages and the everlasting uh, gospel. Continued on, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, My little children, of whom I travel in birth again, again until Christ be formed, in you. This is the gospel, the knowledge of God, the knowledge of his son, 
the increase of grace. This is the everlasting gospel, the life of Jesus Christ and the spirit of holiness. Accepting his propitiation as the one who takes away our sins. Romans chapter 8 verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Remember, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And this gospel is the revelation of the mystery that was hidden. But now it has been revealed unto us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And Christ is in, in us, is the spirit of life, the spirit of righteousness in us. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the last thereof. And that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. For as many of you as have been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. Not unto him that is able to keep you, now that unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Jude 1, 24 and 25. And so, Christ does not bid us to come unto him and to continue in the same life of sin, but a life, he, his life is formed in us so that we may walk in righteousness. Be therefore perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And uh, uh, the Lord will never require of us that which he cannot enable us to do. What is impossible with men, it is possible with God. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Brothers and sisters, this is the gospel. Christ died for us. And he is waiting with a longing desire of a manifestation of himself in his church. As soon as this character will be reproduced, in us, then he shall come and claim us as his own. This is the everlasting gospel. Look at um, the book of First uh, Peter chapter 2. Again, First Peter chapter 2. Let us uh, go there quickly. First Peter chapter 2 and I'll read from verses 1 and then jump to verses verses 1 to verse 5 then i'll jump to uh verse 9 first peter chapter 2 we are told wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking laying all guile away the 144, they have no guile in their mouths. As newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the world that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stone are built up a spiritual house and a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Verse 9, it tells us that, uh, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into marvelous light. Now, think about this for a moment that uh, we have been called as a chosen priesthood. The priests were people who offered the sacrifices in the temple and they had to be cleansed of every impurity. And so the, uh, the work of uh, the gospel is to cleanse us from all sin and remove darkness so that light may shine 
forth. And uh, I, I, I love this sentiment about um, the gospel being light. The gospel, by the way, is the word of God. It is Jesus Christ himself. And uh, when uh, we assimilate it, what does it become in our lives? When we assimilate the gospel, uh, what does it become in our lives? Looking at uh, Christian education, Christian education, page 97. As we assimilate this uh, gospel, what does it become in our lives? The gospel of Christ becomes a personality in those who believe and makes them living episodes known and read of all men. In this way, the living of goldness passes into the multitude. The heavenly intelligences are able to discern the true elements of greatness in character for only goodness is esteemed as efficiency with God. This is what the gospel does. It makes us, it becomes a personality in us. And the person who is formed within is Jesus Christ because the gospel is the embodiment of the word of God. So I'm crucified with Christ, with, with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in, in, in me. The gospel becomes the personality of Jesus Christ in us. Let this mind then be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart, the will is merged in his will, the mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment, uh, with the garment of uh, righteousness, with the garment of uh, of his righteousness. Then, as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment. Not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect, obedient to the law of Jehovah. And then uh, I, I'm reminded of this uh, in the book of uh, uh, Isaiah 61. Isaiah chapter 61. It is verses 10 and 11 talking about when receiving this gospel. Christ is formed within, his personality is formed within, and then we are clothed with the garment of righteousness. This is what Isaiah tells us. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with the jewels, for as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. And so this is the robe that... Uh, Christ himself gives. And uh, it is not woven with any human uh, 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 one in it. It is the garment offered by Jesus Christ himself. Emil Andreasson uh, 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 tells us something about this final generation. He says that uh, the final demonstration of what the gospel can do in and for humanity is still in the future and we are in the period that that's when he was writing christ showed the way he took a human body and in that body demonstrated the power of god men are to follow his example and prove that what god did in christ he can do in every human being who submits to him the world is waiting this demonstration, Romans chapter 8, verse 19, the whole earth groans. The creation is waiting for the manifestation of men. When it has been accomplished, the end will come. God will have fulfilled his plan. He will have shown himself true 
and certain Allah, his government will stand uh, vindicated. In the last generation, God gives the final demonstration that men can keep the law of God and that they can live without sinning. God leaves nothing undone to make the demonstration complete. The only limitation put upon Satan is that he may not kill the saints of God. He may tempt them, he may harass and threaten them, and he does his best, but he fails. He cannot make them sin. They stand the test, and God puts his seal upon them. Through the last generation of saints, God stands finally vindicated. Through them, he defeats Satan and wins his case. This is Emil and Ryerson, the Sanctuary Service, page 299 to 321. Elet J. Wagner, the messenger of righteousness by faith, he says in uh, uh, General Conference Bulletin 1891, pages 156 to 159, in all our Christian experience, we have left little loopholes along here and there for sin. We have never dared to come to that place where we will believe that the Christian life should be a sinless life. We have not dared to believe it or preach it. But in that case, we cannot preach the law of God fully. Why not? Because we do not understand the power of justification by faith. Now, just to remind you, what is this power of justification by faith? faith which is the everlasting gospel we were told that here is the patient of the saints here are they that keep the commandments of god and have the faith of jesus christ and in 12 page 193 paragraph 4 we saw that it is christ taking our sins and giving us his righteousness this is the faith of jesus christ to save us humbly this is the faith of Jesus Christ. Uh, Alonso Trevor Jones, another message of righteousness by faith, General Conference Bulletin 1893, paragraph 207. Christ is to be in us, just as God was in him. And his character is to be born in us, just as God was in him. It is the cooperation of the divine and the human, the mystery of God in you and me. That is the third angel's message. This is the gospel that has to go to the whole world. Talking about Jesus Christ being, uh, God being in Christ and Christ being in us. Uh, let us remind ourselves of this scripture. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 18, uh, verses 17 downwards. Let us remind ourselves of uh, how these things are. We read, uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 downwards, that um, <clears throat> therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. This is the gospel in us, living episodes. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ that be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Brothers and sisters, we are looking at uh, number two in the series, the three angels' messages, and we are looking at the everlasting gospel, what Christ can do for a people who have submitted unto him and accepted him to be their God. He says that he shall cleanse us from every defilement and from every unrighteousness and so christ has to live in his in instruments when uh, god created man he created him in his own image and from the holy seraph unto all the created beings man 
and the angels had to be a dwelling place for God. But sin separated this. Sin came and spoiled the original plan of God. But now through the death of Jesus Christ, the original plan is restored. And then we are told that Christ is coming back to take a people who are without spot and wrinkle, a people who just looks like him. And so Alonzo Trevor Jones continues to say, in Jesus Christ as he was in sinful flesh, God has demonstrated before the universe that he can so take possession of a sinful flesh as to manifest his own presence, his power, and his glory instead of sin manifesting itself. Then God will so take us and so use us that our sinful self shall not appear to influence or affect anybody, but God will manifest his righteous self, his glory before men, in spite of all our self and our sinfulness. And that is, and that is the mystery of God, Christ in you, the hope of glory. God manifest in a sinful flesh. Brothers and sisters, this is the good news that the world has to hear. And not only hear about it, but see it being demonstrated. In, in, in Isaiah chapter 59, look at Isaiah chapter 59 then, what the Bible tells us. This, these are beautiful verses to look at. Isaiah chapter 59, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muted perverseness. But now God's hand is not shortened, and he invites us, look at uh, Isaiah 55, he invites us to come and receive without money. Isaiah chapter 55, Ho everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye by and eat. You come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread? And... You are labor for that which satisfieth not. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. And I'll make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. And those who wait upon the Lord, Isaiah chapter 40 verses 28, those who accept this call, we are told in Isaiah chapter 40 verses 28 to 31, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faindeth not, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases the strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. This is the power of the gospel. This is what it means by waiting upon the Lord. He is the one that renews the strength. Sometimes we have tried to manufacture our own righteousness. We have tried to do things on our own principles, but they have failed us. But those who wait upon the Lord, Christ shall be formed within the hope of glory. The power shall be manifested that is beyond the human power. Let us look at this. The Savior took upon himself the infirmities of humanity and lived a sinless life. That men might have no fear that because of the weakness of human nature, they could not overcome. Christ came to make us partakers of the divine nature 
and his life declares that humanity combined with divinity does not commit sin. The ministry of healing, page 108. This is what he wants us to do. He wants us to stretch our hands and grasp in longing to not under condemnation we have passed from death to life and the spirit of christ in us helps us in our infirmities in that in our weakness the strength of god is made perfect this is so encouraging acts of apostle page 531 no need none need fail of attaining in his fear to perfection of Christian character. By the sacrifice of Christ, provision has been made for the believer to receive all things that pertain to life and goodness. God calls upon us to reach the standard of perfection and places before us the example of Christ's character. None need to fail. If we are in Christ, if we are crucified with him, then that he is living and uh, uh, if we believe that uh, he died and arose, this is what we are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, I'm looking at verse... Uh, verse 15 verse 17 about uh, christ's death and resurrection what it means dead rise not what does it mean by the dead rising and jesus christ rising from the dead for if the dead rise not then is not christ raised but paul goes further and gives an emphasis on this in verse 17 and if christ be not raised your faith is vain ye are yet in your sins Remember the third angel's message ends by that here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, the faith of Jesus Christ is 
to to be witnesses that Christ was raised from the dead. Look at verse 17. This is the faith to believe that Christ was raised from the dead. And if we believe that Christ was raised from the dead, then we are not in sins. But if we do not believe that, that Christ was raised from the dead, then we are still in our sins. So it means that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the annihilation of the powers of darkness and he brings immortality once again to us. And so then we are passed from the dead to life. We are passed from sins to righteousness. Look at Romans chapter 6, what it talks about the resurrection again. Romans uh, chapter 6, as we bring this to an end. Romans chapter 6, about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So when Christ resurrected, he resurrected in the glory of his Father, which means that when we die with Jesus Christ, we rise with the light of heaven. Jesus Christ shines in our hearts. And so none need to fail of attaining in his fear to perfection of Christian character. Again, in his humanity perfected by a life of constant resistance of evil, the Savior showed that through cooperation with divinity, human beings may in this life attain to perfection of character. This is God's assurance to us that we too may obtain complete victory. Acts of Apostle page. chapter 14 verses 1 to 4 you find that the 144 are standing on Mount Zion and they have the character they have the father's name uh, on their forehead John saw a lamb on Mount Zion and with him 144 having his father's name written in their foreheads they bore the signet of heaven they reflected the image of God they were full of the light and the glory of holy one if we will have the image and description of God upon us, we must separate ourselves from all iniquity. We must forsake every evil way, and then we must trust our cases in the hands of Christ. While we are working out our salvation with fear and trembling, God will work in us to will and to do of his own good pleasure. Why were they so specially singled out? Because they had to stand with the wonderful truth right before the whole world and receive their opposition. And while receiving this opposition, they were to remember that they were sons and daughters of God, that they must have Christ formed within the hope of glory. And so, brothers and sisters, these are the people that the Lord is looking for. Those who have in their forehead the seal of the infinite God will guard the world and it is attraction as subordinate to eternal interest. Christ says that there will be those in the church who will present fabots. But we have to study the character of the 144. Other than fight about uh, who will make up the number and all this, we have to study closely the character of these people. Spend time in seeking to know which will be no spiritual uh, we should not spend our time in seeking that which will be of no spiritual help we should ask ourselves what shall i do to inherit eternal life this is the all important question and it has been clearly answered what is written in the law how written down and so there are many conjectures about the 144 there are a lot of debates about it but what we need is not a theory of that and a theory of this but 
what shall we do to inherit eternal life? Do we have the Father's signet in our forehead? And so I'd like to close with this, that uh, we are living in a world where sin is reaching its limit. But when the people will see us living the life that we profess, they will be able to accept the truth in large numbers. The time of God's destructive judgment is the time of mass for those who have an oppor no opportunity to learn what is truth. Tenderly will the Lord look upon them. His heart of mass is touched. His hand is still stretched out to save while the door is closed to those who will not enter. Large numbers will be admitted who in these last days hear the truth for the first time. Our life has to reveal what God has done to us. The 14th chapter of Revelation is a chapter of the deepest interest. This, this, this scripture will soon be understood in all its bearings, and the messages given to John the Revelator will be repeated with distinct utterance. Christ is coming the second time with power unto salvation to prepare human beings for this event. He has sent the first, second, and the third angel's messages. These angels represent those who receive the truth and with power open the gospel to the world. The churches have been become, as described in the 18th chapter of Revelation, they are the messages. Why are the messages of Revelation 14 given? Because the principles of the churches have become corrupted. Apparently, the whole world is guilt of receiving the mark of the beast. But the prophet sees a company who are not worshipping the beast and who have not received his mark in their foreheads or in their hands. Here is the patience of the saints, he declares. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. May the Lord continue speaking to our heart in our daily lives that we may be a representative of him. We may be ambassadors as we are told in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 21. This world, we are living as pilgrims, as strangers. We are representatives of another world. Let us, by our conduct and character, show that really the everlasting gospel has done something in our lives. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for those who believe in the gospel. It becomes a personality in them. Let it be a savor of life unto life unto us. And may you continue communing with us in every way. Save us from self. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. May the Lord bless us. I know the Lord is good and uh, is going to do his marvelous work in our lives if we give ourselves unto him. God be with you.